Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, good morning, or almost af afternoon. Uh, thank you for being present here at ThanosCon today. I uh, hope you've built some appetite for Thanos in addition to lunch. Uh, now that we have some understanding of how, as to how Thanos stands as a solution for scale metrics and longer retention, it is also important to understand how to manage this data in an efficient manner as it grows. So one way of doing this is through multi-tenancy, which is the topic for our presentation today, and uh, maybe a better way of calling it as multiverse of Thanos. So a bit of introduction to begin with. My name is Colleen, and here's my uh, colleague Jacob. Uh, Jacob, Jacob and I have been working as software engineers at uh, Red Hat, and we primarily work in the observability realm, and it's been about a year, and we contribute to monitoring projects such as Thanos and Prometheus. And also, this is our first time attending KubeCon. Okay, uh, to begin with, let's understand, uh, let's uh, understand this through definition what multi-tenancy is. This is basically a concept in software architecture whereby a single software instance can serve multiple distinct user groups. These user groups can be as fine-grained as a single user or a group of users that come together to form in the form of teams, services, clusters, or organizations. So uh, we can broadly classify them as two types. Uh, uh, the idea being of one is soft tenancy, which is also known as logical tenancy, uh, taking the analogy of an apartment complex where each, uh, each of the flats share common resources such as water, electricity, where in, uh, in technic technical terms that would mean segregating your data and resources at the application or database level uh, when they share the same resources uh, or physical hardware. Uh, the other form is hard tenancy, also known as physical tenancy, where, again, you have a bunch of houses that have their own utilities, separate utilities, so that, so basically there's isolation at the physical level, means each tenant's data is stored at a separate physical or virtual servers. So now that we know what multi-tenancy is, uh, we need to understand why do we need tenancy. So a disclaimer. Any resemblance to real life is purely coincidental, and hope we do not uh, offend any DC or Marvel fans. Otherwise, you can sue Ch chat GPT for that. Okay, uh, so we have an international superhero alliance, which is operating across the globe, managing different facets of superhero activities, such as mission deployment, threat assessment, superhero training, and emergency response. Now, each team within that alliance as, as normal engineers make use of microservices and to maintain their specific domains. And they heavily rely on observability to ensure that their operations run smoothly and to quickly diagnose any uh, and address any issues. So here we have Dave. He's a site reliability engineer and a multiverse guardian. He prides himself in keeping the digital cogs running smoothly. It's the start of the month. He's ready to tackle whatever challenges come across his way. and. Uh, yeah. So one morning, his routine is interrupted by the uh, the cloud infrastructure bills. So if, even superheroes are humbled by uh, bills at the end of the day. And then he's wondering uh, these uh, where these costs come from. Is there a secret mission running or some alien invasion? Then he quickly starts digging into the cost explorer, but the numbers don't make sense to him, and they look as cryptic as ever. So, he, so this superhero alliance basically sprawls across uh, numerous services and micro uh, uh, services, and uh, each innovating at a breakneck pace. He realizes that without tenancy implemented in the observability, he wouldn't be able to attribute costs or hold teams accountable for their resource usage that they are uh, making. And it, this, it's, it's like trying to solve a jigsaw puzzle without a picture in the box. So they're basically flying blind with the company's credit card. Right. Okay. Um, so now hopefully we convince you that you need tenancy, right? So let's have a look at some of the challenges you might face uh, or some of the requirements you have in a multi-tenant setup. So um, obviously the first thing that you want to do is to have data isolation, right? Um, because like, if you're operating across the multiverse, I mean, obviously you don't want to end up in a confusing situation like these guys, right? So you need to make sure that you know, the data from different tenants are kept in isolation and separate from each other, right? Um, and in Thanos, we can use labels to do that, and we'll, we'll see how, how it works in a bit. Um, 
the other thing you kind of want to think about is resource isolation, right? So now you have a, a bunch of different teams or tenants that are uh, sort of fighting for resources, right? And you want to make sure that you don't have like a bad tenant, for example, that start like uh, using a lot of resources and then interrupting the service for all of the other guys that are behaving well, right? So a resource isolation is, is quite a good thing to have in a, in a multi-tenant setup and we have uh, some ways of, of doing, of uh, implementing this in Thanos as well, which we'll look into um, slightly later. Uh, and then there's, uh, you know, a cost aspect as well. Um, it, it's um, quite good to know if you have multiple tenants that which one are actually using up the more re most resources and are costing you a lot of money, right? Because we don't want to um, have the, the infrastructure bill just run wild. So you want to make sure to attribute costs to different teams. And maybe you're even billing different teams or organizations or even outside your organization and you want to just have an understanding of which of, which of the tenants are are costing the most uh, on the infrastructure side. And so scale is something, you know, we've had a couple of talks now on scale. And when you have a multi-tenant setup, you just want to make sure it's scalable, right? Um, and yeah, Thanos hopefully should work well for that. So I won't really dwell into too much details on that one. Um, and then there are some sort of things you can think about on security and compliance, right? Um, we talked about like hard tenancy and soft tenancy um, and the difference between them. And I think uh, if you have really strict security or compliance requirements, you have quite sensitive data in your, in your database. Maybe you want to think about doing more of a hard tenancy and harder to harder isolation uh, than having a, a soft tenancy setup where things are closer together, right? So it's a good thing just to, to keep in mind uh, when setting up your system and choosing kind of your tenancy model. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Okay, uh, so now let's look at how uh, multi-tenancy is adopted in Thanos. Uh, here we have a simple setup of Thanos and uh, with its various components. Uh, there are two ways of ingestion into a Thanos setup. One is through sidecar and receive. For, ten for the purpose of tenancy, we specifically choose the receive component uh, as of now. And uh, uh, the receive component uh, uh, in the ingestion path has had the, te the tenancy capability for a while. And as of a recent release, now we have tenancy awareness in the query component. So, in, so let's look at the ingestion path. So basically, you don't need a general setup. Uh, receive will handle tenants as they come in. Uh, all you have to do is in the remote write client request, you need to set up the HTTP header with your tenant label. And then the receive adds a label to the ingested metric and uh, which corresponds to the HTTP header. And when a new value is detected in the uh, tenant HTTP header, receivers will provision and start and manage an independent TSDB for that tenant. And then the TSDB blocks are sent to the S3 uh, with a unique tenant ID and then can be used to compact blocks independently, independently for each tenant. Um, now that we're able to ingest metrics through receive, we also want to limit or control the amount of metrics that as the services grow and we em emit more metrics. So this helps to ensure that no single tenant overloads the system or causes outages or disturbances for the other tenants. Uh, the limits can be set up on a global level at the component, at the receive component, at a default uh, uh, limit for all the tenants and also per tenant limits. Uh, looking at per tenant limits, uh, uh, the, the limits are set at the request level. So we have something like size byte limits, basically the maximum uh, size of the incoming remote write request, zero, mean, zero meaning no limit. Uh, then we have the series limit, which is the maximum amount of series in a remote, uh, single remote write request that can be sent for that tenant. And then there's the samples limit, which is the number of samples in the remote write request, which is a sum of all the, a sum from all the series that uh, are a part of that request. Um, this, this is, uh, there's also a limit that you can set based on the uh, number of active series across all the replicas. And uh, yeah, this is on, on the tenant level. So uh, there's also, uh, through the receive hash ring, you can also route your uh, route uh, the metrics coming from a specific tenant to a specific set of receivers. So uh, this helps uh, to ensure that, say, you have a, criti a critical tenant and you want to ensure that you don't want to lose metrics on those tenants. 
you can route it to a specific set of receivers. And um, there, recently there's uh, also a capability that was added to uh, match regex patterns for the tenants in the part of that list, and uh, which is an interesting PR to take a look at. Right, okay, so let's look at the uh, enforcement on the career path or tenancy on the career path. So this is a pretty new thing. Uh, it's only sort of the last big piece arrived, I think, in the last release. Um, and so there's a new flag to the courier to enable uh, a tenancy enforcement and it's off by default, right? So everything will work as normal. Um, and it works like, pretty similar to, to the receive side, right? So you, uh, you send a HTTP header to identify the tenant and then what the query actually does is that it enforces a label, right? And as we've heard, that's a bit of a topic today. Um, we're using prompt label proxy in the backend. We are sort of importing it as a library, so uh, we didn't have too, too much specific code to Thanos, which is nice. Um, yeah, so that's basically how it works. Pretty simple. There's a quick example here where we have a bunch of metrics and with no tenancy enforced, you can see there's a bunch of um, results coming in from all of the different tenants. And then if we enable the tenancy, you only see the one from your sp one specific tenant. There's a box in the UI that will show up. It didn't quite make, make the last release, so it will come soon. That will allow you to like enter the tenant name, so you can kind of play around, around with the query UI. And yeah, so that's uh, like the enforcement part. Now, one of the cool things now that we have tenancy awareness, and probably one of the main reasons that we wanted it in there actually is to get a better understanding of how the tenants, different tenants behave in, in, on the query path, right? So this is something we couldn't do before, before we had a proxy in front to actually enable if, to do the tenancy enforcement. Uh, but now that we have it natively in, in Thanos, we can start getting some metrics. So there's one example here, which is quite interesting. Um, it's actually meant for like measuring query latency in respect to the result size of the, of the, of the queries, but we can also use it uh, like this, so there's a bunch of different buckets you can see on the left hand side um, and then on the right side is basically how many times this tenant had make a query that is of where the result is of that size, right? So this first tenant uh, is making quite a lot of small queries, so you can see all of the basically all of the, the queries that it's making is less than 100 samples and 100 series returns, so quite a small set of samples. Um, if you look at a different tenant, uh, this one has a more varied set of queries coming in. Um, and some really, really large ones. So uh, the top ones you can see are actually hitting this infinite bucket, which probably means you should change your bucket sizes, right? Um, to get a better understanding of, of the sizes of those. Uh, but even if these two tenants are like do, making the same amount of queries, we can probably say that this tenant here is causing a lot more load on the system. And this is super interesting to start to dig down into this kind of, uh, kind of data. Um, there's a bunch of other uh, metrics we can look into. Uh, there are some on the store level as well, because we're propagating the tenant also all the way to the store. So you can start looking at like which tenants are having a high utilization of the cache or something like that. Um, cool. Um, and also, it's a good thing to know that these metrics they will exist even if you don't enable enforcement, right? So even if you don't need enforcement for some reason, you can still get the metrics, uh, which is cool. You just need to send the HTTP header correctly. Um, great. Uh, so just a couple more things on the architecture when you're setting this up. Um, so if you have layered queries, it's important to know where we're actually enforcing the tenancy. And basically the thing to remember is that we're just enforcing tenancy on the first level query, which is hit by a prompt query, right? So like this, if we're enforcing it on the, on the first query and there, it will work fine. Uh, but if you might think that you could enable uh, enforcement just on, the, on these uh, queries on the right-hand side, but that won't actually work. Uh, the, all the requests coming in on our most layer, they won't have a tenancy enforced. Um, so it's a good thing to keep in mind. I'm not sure if this is what we want, but this is how it is for now, at least. Uh, something we can to discuss maybe. Um, 
And then the other thing is that FANAS doesn't do any authorization or authentication. It just looks at these HTTP headers that are coming in and assume that it will be fine. Um, so probably you're going to want to have something in front, some proxy that are actually putting these headers in there to make sure that you know that, that it's the correct tenants that are setting the correct labels. Uh, we use Observatorium API, but I'm, I'm sure there are a bunch of others uh, that can work. Um. Yeah, uh, so looking at the future, now that we uh, understand how tenancy is implemented in query and receive, there are also some future scope of work that can be taken care of. So uh, like, like setting uh, limits in the receive component, we can also set uh, try and set up limits in the query component, which prevents any single tenant from monopolizing the shared resources to ensure there is fair, fair usage across all tenants. By, uh, uh, so this way you can prevent scenarios when there are extensive queries that can degrade the performance or cause uh, a noisy neighbor issue. Uh, also for the purpose of data, uh, analytics or monitoring or billing, it, there can be added a capability to cross tenant queries from multiple tenants under controlled uh, circumstances. This becomes useful for ad administrators or services that need to aggregate the data across their uh, systems. Uh, lastly, it's at the end of the day, it's all about uh, how you optimize your uh, resource usage and the metrics that you're sending, and then you're not overwhelming your systems, which boils down to infrastructure costs. So this is, uh, this is an important aspect to assess your resources consumed, uh, including all the storage, computer, and data transfer to so that you can allocate and budget your uh, observability usage. Uh, now going back to our use case scenario, so Dave finally has implemented multi-tenancy across his alliance, and uh, this, uh, this uh, to recognize the challenge of spiraling costs, and he said to uh, ensure that each team each team takes responsibility for their own metrics and resource usage and yeah thank you uh, thank you for listening and here are our social handles please feel free to connect and uh, I'd like to take any questions if there are Um, so, any questions? Yes? Okay. Um, Performance-wise, is there a difference to using the um, tenant in queries compared to just including, say, the tenant label in the query? Sorry, could you repeat that? So, is there di fundamentally is there a difference between if you have a tenanted query? Um, to using the, the interface for um, with the header, or if you just include the label in the query, the tenant label. Hopefully not. I mean, the the, the courier like if it just it just basically adds the label in front. Of it. We haven't done any measurements, but it should be pretty quick to just inject the label, right? Yeah, yeah like you wouldn't face any performance issues within Thanos, but it depends on like what you're using as a proxy. So the proxy will authenticate and then assign the tenant header and then forward the request. So that's the only latency one. Um, is tenancy enforcement applicable to Prometheus instances or other store components? Um, or is it only for the receiver now? Yeah, so uh, I guess it, anytime you would have a tenant ID, it will enforce it, right? So if you ingest data in some other way and you add correct labels uh, that the courier will understand, but then it will just enforce the label. Hi. Um, are there any scenarios that should create separate receiver instances instead of creating multi-tenancy in one receiver instance? Not specifically for tenancy, I think. I mean, uh, 
it could be that like you want to have different um, tenants on different receive like hash rings because you know some of the tenants are using uh, or need like dedicated instances because they are ingesting a lot of data, right? But otherwise, I think you can run everything through a single instance. Cool. Anyone else? Going once, going twice. Okay, thanks, Colleen and Jacob. <laughs>